Uh, welcome, everybody. So um, since we just got back from lunch, uh, my first job, if I succeed, is to keep you all awake. Because um, there's this thing called itis that you might get <laughs> after eating a lot sitting in a comfortable chair. So if I can keep that from happening, I'll have uh, done my job. Um, the title here is a little bit different. The reason is because this started as two talks and it got merged into one. Uh, I'm actually going to talk about two tools, not just one as advertised in that title. Let me tell you a little bit of the background here. This work, uh, the seeds of this work were planted in uh, a wonderful symposium we had here at Ida in October 2020 on orbital debris. And that's when Joel and I actually kind of formally met and bonded, and the rest is history. Now, uh, now Joel's not here, but he's off doing things. He's blowing stuff up today, I believe. And so, um, you know, spoiler alert, there's going to be stuff that blows up in this briefing, and hopefully that keeps you awake. Um, so at that meeting was Donald Kessler. Donald Kessler you may know of as the sort of the Kessler effect where we have cascading collisions in space as portrayed maybe not too accurately in the movie Gravity. Uh, that's sort of what has motivated this work. But, um, and, and I, I'd like to acknowledge a few people. First is Bob Sewell who was the OED division director here for many years. He, um, this started as internal R&D money, and we've turned it into uh, actual tasking. Um, he's been a constant uh, you know, support and guidance beacon. Bram, who's taken over for him, has continued that. Uh, there's a guy named Bob Stellingwerf, who is a uh, astrophysicist par excellence, who wrote one of the codes that we use, the SPH code, which I'll tell you about. And uh, also in the audience, I think, is Peter Mancini. There he is. And uh, he helps run these codes and make sense of the data. Um, so let me go to the next slide. OK, so we're, the starting point here is, you know, what if we have a catastrophic collision of something with a satellite? It could be a small piece of debris. It could be uh, another satellite spacecraft. Or it could be, as we saw in November of uh, 2015, I'm sorry, November of, tw of 2020, uh, an ASAT, a Russian ASAT, uh, which we've also worked on, but I can't talk about that today. So that's what's motivating this. Here's kind of an outline of what we're going to talk about. We have a couple assessment tools. Point two here, there's a smooth particle hydrodynamics tool which tells us how stuff blows up. It's basically what it is. It's hypervelocity code. We get fragments out of that. And then those fragments are propagated with a propagator to see where they go and what happens. So those are the two tools. Um, as an example, we're going to take a Starlink-like satellite and subject it to a sort of an ASAT uh, collision. Um, then we'll try and illustrate how the propagation part of this fits into a larger assessment of what I referred to earlier as the Kessler effect. OK, so here's the, here's the layout. This top picture here, I think I have a laser pointer right here. This is from the uh, ESA, uh, European Space Agency. Uh, this is the debris uh, around the Earth. This is low Earth orbit. This is the geocentric ring. And we could have you know, just a regular debris hit on a, on a satellite. That can happen. This is our Starlink mock-up. And then those debris, a collision happens right there, they start to encircle the Earth. Lots of fragments. So as I mentioned, we have two tools, SPHC, C stands for actual C, the code, the, the, the language C, 
And then um, this, this tool I'm not going to talk about. This is Joel's specialty, what happens if a, if a piece of debris actually hits a satellite. Can we characterize the penetration? Can we characterize the degree of damage? Is it a mission kill? Is it a total kill? I can't talk to that. That's, that's his bailiwick. OK, so here's the sort of flow diagram. We have, whoops, let's go forward. We have a impact. We use H SPHC to figure out where the fragments go or what, what fragments are generated. It creates a debris cloud. We propagate that debris, and then we get an orbital debris flux out of it. How many particles per unit area per unit time in a, in a point in space or in areas of space. Now, that debris could create, um, we get small debris, we get large debris, we have a feedback loop here. And so, again, we have these two tools, and I'm going to concentrate on SPHC to start off. Here again is a, a Starlink like satellite. Let me just remind folks, um, for those of you who don't do space science, what the speeds and scales are here. So if you're orbiting the Earth at low Earth orbit, you're going about seven and a half kilometers per second. So I live in Greenbelt. I could commute to Ida in four seconds. Um, now, the braking maneuver would kill me because of the Gs, because <laughs> I, <laughs> but because <laughs> it would be hundreds of Gs to slow down. It's incredibly fast. Just to give you an idea, a 22 might go, a 22 caliber rifle bullet might go at sort of 800 to 1,000 feet per second, sort of th maybe Mach 1 if you're lucky. Okay, so we're talking about speeds that are 20 times that. We can't see a 22. You certainly cannot see seven kilometers per second like George Clooney does in the movie Gravity. Okay, you can't see it, and you certainly can't react to it. So, just setting the scale there. All right, so let's do some collision physics here. Uh, we have two bodies, mass m1, m2, and we want to know what the kinetic energy of the collision is. And it's given by this expression. This, this mu here is called the reduced mass. Every particle physicist in here knows what that is. Um, and we have two collision scenarios here. We have a small aluminum sphere hitting a Starlink satellite that's about 250 kilogram. And this is the figure of merit. It's the, in, this energy divided by the mass of the satellite. And we designed this to be about 40 joules per, per gram. That's kind of a threshold for catastrophic um, breakup of a satellite. Now, if we have an ASAT traveling at about the, at the same speed, you can see we're orders of magnitude more catastrophic, if you will. Let me just jump down to here. Forget about this center of mass stuff. Um, the 40 joules per gram number comes from actual hypervelocity testing that's been done to try and get a handle on this problem. And that's a huge number. And just to give you an idea how big that number is, if you were to drop a satellite from four kilometers altitude out of an airplane, uh, and let's just assume we don't have any air resistance, that's, that's enough energy density to get to 40 joules per gram. Seems like overkill to me. When it hits the ground, it's going about a kilometer per second. Um, I would like to do this David Letterman style with a piano. <laughs> OK, so how do we simulate this breakup <coughs> of a satellite? There's a dearth of experimental data, very little. And so we have to hang our hats on models. This is the model that we use. It's called smooth, hydro, smooth particle hydrodynamics model. It's a way of doing um, computational continuum mechanics using particles as the entity of interest. So the basic idea is developed by astrophysicists in the 70s uh, to study what they do. 
exploding stars, colliding galaxies, all, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, the basic idea is to divide up the continua into particles, and then you smooth them out with some kind of kernel function, like a Gaussian, so they spread over a wider area, <laughs> and they interact through that. I'm not going to go through the details. Uh, for our purposes, the advantages are it's mesh-free. You don't have to define a grid that, you know, or adaptive grid or anything like that. It's highly parallelizable, and it's really well-suited for this problem, hypervelocity collisions. There are some disadvantages. I understand, I'm not an expert in this, that these disadvantages have been largely overcome. Boundary conditions, there is a computational cost that's a little bit higher than doing Alarian continuum mechanics. So we at IDA run this code, as I said, is developed by this guy, Bob Stellingworth, who's con under contract at IDA. And Peter runs this code, a lot of it. Uh, runs on a multi-core Intel machine. Typical, what's the turnaround time for a run? A couple days, yeah. All right, and here's some relevant references down here about smooth particle hydrodynamics. All right, that's a collision between a small, could you tell me when I have five minutes left, please? Thanks. That's a small particle hitting um, a Starlink-like satellite coming in this direction at 13 kilometers per second. We've done that. The one I'm gonna talk about is this sort of like an ASAT. It's, it's really a cylinder. And it's actually, this is also 13 kilometers per second. This is wrong. And you can see uh, 300 uh, microseconds later, 0.3 milliseconds, that the ASAT has penetrated and here it is now. You can see the ASAT fragments and you can see the Starlink fragments. And later on in time, the residual stresses in this satellite are gonna cause this stuff to break up. Unfortunately, SPH can't capture that, so we capture that in another way that I can't, this would take too much time to talk about now. Okay, so what do we get out of this? We get a huge file, it's called a cluster file, and it tells us how many of these particles are in each cluster, the mass of the cluster, the position and velocity and what phase it is. It could be a solid, could be a gas, could be liquid. So we take those data and then we insert them into the tool that I made and run. But here's a picture, first of all, of what some of the data looks like. This is in the, in the um, fragment community, orbital fragment community, they think they, they look at the number of particles greater than a certain mass. And they call it a cumulative, which would drive any statistician crazy, but that's what they call it. So this is the number of particles greater than the mass here. And you can see it's pretty much a perfect power law. I don't know why that is. <laughs> Bob Stellingworth does, but we haven't gotten that out of him yet. Here you can see the fragment velocities in the frame of the satellite. Okay, so this is the path of the satellite here. You can see the ASAT fragments being ejected. Okay, very high speed. Here are the fragments that remain that cross, the, those, those fragments have actually cross the shell of the constellation, and I'll show you that in a second. Okay, so what is the debris? This is, this is where I come in, um, debris prop, integrates the equations of motion for the fragments around the Earth. This is done in an inertial system. It's more convenient to do that. There's an adjustable gravity model. I can add terms in that for longer term <laughs> integrations. Um, I don't include the perturbations from the moon and sun and stuff like that. Not for this um, application. Uh, currently integrating drag into the model that will happen in a, in a week or so. The computational framework is MATLAB. It's a historical artifact. I started flying satellites about 25 years ago, and it's never left my uh, computer. So I have tools I developed back in the day that I still use. Um, it's, it's not perfect, but it's good enough. Um, 
for numerical integration, short-term integration, you can use the MATLAB integrator. It's fine. But for long-term stuff, you need something more powerful, something compiled. I compile a Fortran 90 um, um, code and pipe the integration to that. It's uh, done with a so-called symplectic integrator, if you've ever heard of those. Those are for conservative systems. They, like without drag, they conserve certain geometric properties of the conservative phase space. With drag, we'll have to give that up and use Rangikata or British Stur. So that's a TDB or TBD. Okay, so here's what we get out of that. Um, first of all, so, some of the fragments actually escape Earth orbit, so I haven't shown those. These are the ones that are bound to the Earth. They don't escape. Most of the fragments re-enter. And why is that? Well, for one of these engagements that's head on, a lot of the fragments get ejected backwards. And it only takes about 100 meters per second aft delta V to take something from Starlink altitude of 550 kilometers to bring it down to about 200 kilometers. At 200 kilometers, the drag is going to um, take over and um, it'll deorbit after that. So most of the fragments, whoops, go back. Most of the fragments re-enter. These are the remaining fragments after, so th this is this minus that. There they are. And now <coughs> we're really only interested for the purposes of blowing up other Starlink satellites because that's so much fun. Um, we're, we're interested in finding the ones that cross the constellation shell that, that Starlink is riding on. This constellation shell right here is, is it's a little bit old. This has got 70, 72 planes as standard. That's, that's not going to change. 20 birds per plane. So that's 1,440 satellites in this constellation. So any one of these fragments could potentially collide with, a, with a Starlink, another Starlink satellite. So that's what we're interested in. And there are two possibilities. If you so here's the here are the reentry um, or the, the entering points, if you will, up through the shell and down through the shell with the X's. And basically, if if the collision is like that, then you, the relative velocity is going to be such that the collision um, speed isn't that high. It could disable the satellite, but it's it might might live through it. On the other hand, the collision could also be more like this, more more head on. In which case, you have uh, relative velocities ten or above kilometers per second. That's going to kill your satellite. You're not living through that. How much time do I have? Eight minutes. Oh, I'm going too fast. Should I give the talk over? <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Since I'm going so fast, I'm, I'm you know, if you've got something like, oh, I don't quite get that. All right. OK, so this is a diagram that some of you may have seen. This is called a Gabbard diagram. It's developed by um, a guy named John Gabbard, who worked for NORAD. And it's really. For the physicists in the audience, it's like you know, this is like a scattering plot. You know, you're looking at where stuff goes after a collision. And in this case, what you're looking at is every fragment here has two points. There's an apogee of the fragment and a perigee of the fragment, and this is the per orbital period of the fragment. So the collision happened right here, and you can see that a lot of these fragments get kicked up to very, very high altitudes. Uh, you know, this is where GPS lives up here. Um, so, the and by the way, um, when the Chinese did their ASAT test, which was done at 800 kilometers, most of which the debris is still up there, um, and that's you know, right around in here, I guess. 
Um, you know, that stuff's going to be up there for a long time. So anything up in here is basically up there for effective eternity. It's not coming down. It's not coming down by drag, at least. Could come down by, you know, other means, maybe. So that, that's the story here. Uh, we get a lot of fragments that are... That, are, that can do damage, not just to the Starlink constellation if we're Elon Musk and worried about our, you know, if, if we're not worried about Twitter at the moment. Um, uh, if you're worried about your, the safety of your constellation, I mean, th this is going to endanger lots of other stuff as well. So um, that's the message. Um, again, Joel, my partner in crime here, has developed this tool called SatPen. And so um, let me come back to this for a second. I just want to talk uh, a little bit about, about this problem. So we got all of these um, crossings. So it's possible to estimate what the probability of hitting another Starlink satellite is because I mean, a simple calculation, you just add up the area of all of the Starlink satellites. The Starlink satellite's about two meters, two or three meters long, about a meter wide. Is that right, Peter? Well, you're doing this. <laughs> yeah, it's something like that. So, so you add them all up. So 1,440 times the area of a Starlink satellite. That's an area. Now you divide that by 4 pi r squared, r being the radius from the center of the Earth. And you, that's the fraction of area that's occupied by Starlink satellites. So every time you pierce the sphere, you're, you, you, you will hit that area, that patch, with some probability given by that ratio. And so if you know the frequency of these these piercings, you can calculate the rate at which you would expect at least one, um, you know, Starlink satellite to be hit. I've done that. Unfortunately, I did not put that slide in today. So it's sort of like one every, for this one, I think it was sort of like one every four or five years. I can't remember. But um, don't take my word on it. So we can get estimates of the follow-on collision probability using these methodologies. Okay, and now I come back to what Joel does, which is he takes that newly generated flux, which by the way has just been added to the existing flux that's already there, and he uses his tool SatPen that if there is a collision, what the heck happens? So he can calculate a probability of satellite loss uh, and that's going to be of interest to anyone who has um, satellites that are, in, in the case of uh, the DOD, um, DOD actually has a crater with Starlink to investigate Army comms. And so the Army would like to know uh, how often they're going to lose one of these birds. Uh, and is that going to be critical to their operations? So to conclude, we have a set of tools, SPH to generate the fragments, debris prop to figure out where they go and where they, what might happen, and, and really sat pen to tell us what it is that's going to, you know, the bad stuff that could happen if there is a collision. And that kind of wraps up what I'm going to talk about, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, sir. Well, this is a great question. The Starlink satellite is, what's that? 
Um, gentleman asked how big the Starlink satellite is compared to other satellites. Typical size. First, let me let me ask a slightly or answer a slightly different question. It's one of the weirdest satellites I've ever seen. It it looks like a deck of cards. Okay, it's very flat. And the reason they do that is so they can stack so many into a given launch. I think there's 20 or something like that. Is that right? So um, in terms of cross-sectional area, I think it's probably about, I mean, if you're looking at it from the, the maximum projection, it's probably typical of other sort of comm satellites and things like that, low Earth orbit satellites. It's not a bus. It's not, it's not like some of those geobirds. And it's not a CubeSat. So would it fit into what's called um, a mini-sat? Maybe. Might, might be considered a mini-sat. Other question? Yes, sir. Yeah. From Australia. How are you doing? We're looking to take over the Earth, man. Oh, uh, <laughs> no, we're looking to base. This was a warm-up calculation, okay, to get to the real calculation, which we're now doing with the Russian ASAT fragments, which we have a, a complete model of, and we are actually now able to compare our predictions from from our models to what's actually flying, the, the actual fragments that are up there now from the Russian ASAT test. So that, this was an R&D project that was able to be shoehorned into follow-on work. And um, Dan, we're gonna brief the Air Force Secretary at the end of May, right? Yeah, so we'll be briefing Kendall at the end of May on, on our work on that problem. Other questions? Okay, thanks.